Hey everybody, have you ever wondered how they fly those starships around the, the galaxy and the universe in Star Wars and Star Trek? <sighs> Me too. Well, anyway, that is not our topic today. However, we are going to be in outer space because we're going to talk about navigation satellite systems. That's right, folks. This is the Instrument Rating Course, and welcome back to the Epic Flight Academy. My name is Mike Thompson, and to be successful in the course, of course we want you to watch these videos. But that's only one of three parts. Remember, you must also be studying Epic's online instrument rating course, and thirdly, review all of this content in detail with your flight instructor. So what about navigation satellite systems? Well, you might hear it referred to as GNSS, Gulf November Sierra Sierra. That stands for Global Naviga Navigation Satellite System. And by utilizing a network of satellites, they broadcast information which can be used to determine position. Now, this is a common term for navigation satellite constellations, and there are four major constellations currently around the planet. The United States constellation system is known as GPS, or Global Positioning System. GPS is the United States version of the GNSS. This system consists of three major components. We're going to list them here. The first is the space component. This consists of a minimum of 24 satellites in six different orbital, or orbital planes. This guarantees at least four satellites in the field of view of your aircraft's receiver and typically more like six or eight at any given time. The second major component of the GPS system is the user. And by this, we mean the GPS receiver or whatever it is we're using to receive that signal, such as in your airplane, the G1000, or maybe your iPad or your handheld cell phone, that type of thing. And then the third major component is what we call the control. This is monitoring and control stations that are managed by the US Air Force and the Department of defense. So how does GPS work? Well, on our slide here, the satellites that you see are actually the simple part. It's our receivers that do the work in determining position. Your GPS receiver will obtain signals from multiple different satellites. Now, the two principles of the GPS receiver are pseudo-ranging and trilateration. Now, those are two pretty big words. Let's take a look at what they mean. Pseudo-range refers to your GPS receiver's capability to calculate distance. And it does it with this formula, distance equals rate times time. Now, this is similar to the way DME works. We talked about that in a previous video. The knowns in this formula are rate and time. We know the rate at which the signal travels. It travels at the speed of light. And we know time when we can measure the time between the satellite and the receiver. So in pseudo-ranging, those two factors are used to calculate distance. Now, the second component is trilateration. With the pseudo-range distance, the receiver will draw an imaginary sphere. The more satellites that we have, the more of these spheres that we can get. With this, we can determine a precise position. Now, if we have at least three satellites, we can get a two-dimensional position. 
With at least four satellites, we can get a three-dimensional position. And the more satellites we have, the more spheres can be trilaterated and the more accurate our position. Now, what about when we're using the GPS in the aircraft? The GPS receiver in the aircraft must be certified according to specific technical standard orders. And it must be built into or integral to your aircraft's avionics system in order to be approved for IFR navigation. So what about my iPad or my cell phone? Yes, I might refer to those. Those cannot be used to navigate IFR because they are not built into the aircraft or in compliance with this tech standard order. Now, I want you to review this in detail in the AIM Chapter 1 dash one dash 17 and work with your flight instructor. Now there are two systems currently in use to verify the accuracy of your GPS navigation system. The first one is called RAIM, R-A-I-M. That stands for Receiver Autonomous Integrity Monitoring. The requirements for a GPS receiver to have in order to operate under IFR with GPS. Now, this RAIM system can either alert the pilot to position errors or a fault and then remove that faulty satellite calculation from its navigational solution. So, in short, two functions of RAIM are seen here, fault detection and fault exclusion. Now, notice with RAIM, I'm not going to get fault detection unless my receiver can pick up a minimum of five satellites. And RAIM won't do fault exclusion unless I, my receiver, is picking up at least six satellites. The second system is called WAS, and that stands for Wide Area Augmentation System. Now, this system is different than RAIM in that it will actually correct for errors in faulty GPS signals. It is independent of RAIM, and it is not required to have WAS in order to have RAIM. With both systems available, you're guaranteed accuracy of the GPS to an extremely high level. Now, this WASS, Wide Area Augmentation System, or WAS, consists of five components. The GPS satellite itself, reference stations, which are on the ground, a master control station, which is also on the ground, the ump uplink station, and geostationary WAS satellites. So let's take a look at this diagram and kind of walk through exactly what WAS is doing. Now notice on the map of the United States here, we're showing some ground reference stations. And up in the sky, you can see some GPS satellites. Now, over on the West Coast, in our imaginary diagram, we have the master control station, which uplinks to our communication satellite. Now, that communication satellite sends corrected signals out to the other GPS satellites and directly to your aircraft. The idea here is this. Even though these GPS satellites are fine-tuned into a very, very precise orbit, because they are literally floating in space, they may not be able to keep their position exactly. However, if you look at our map, the blue dots, which represent ground stations, will in fact always have the exact same location. So when the ground station and the satellite talk to each other, if there's any error, 
that is detected. And if and when it's detected, the ground station sends it directly to the master control station, which uplinks it to the comm satellite, and that corrected signal is sent, again, to the GPS satellites, as well as directly to your aircraft. Now, that enables WAS navigation to be very precise. Now, that same precision might lead us to a possible hazardous attitude. And this hazardous attitude sounds something like this. Wow, this stuff is so reliable. What could possibly go wrong? I've never had any of this equipment fail me. It must be foolproof. It's never going to fail. <laughs> Remember that hazardous attitude? Okay, we don't want to fall prey to that and understand that it is possible for GPS to have errors. GPS signals can be disturbed in a variety of ways, and they're not always 100% accurate. Now, if we know that there's a GPS disturbance, a NOTAM will be put out. And you can review these NOTAMs with your instructor prior to your flight. So I want you to review this in detail with your flight instructor. Now, take a look at this diagram. This is a picture of your MFD, and we're looking at the GPS status page. Now, I want you to work through the GPS status page on the MFD, in the FTD, and in the aircraft in detail with your flight instructor. So let's move over to the PFD. And here we show the G1000 PFD, and we just want to walk around this PFD and introduce you to some of these common components. Now, let's start over here on the left-hand side of our screen, and we see the deviation indicator. This deviation indicator is shown on the heading indicator, and it will show how far off of a selected course you might be. As we work our way around to the top, and we're going to go to the nav source input. Here, you can tune in different navigation aids. All right, as we work our way around, you see the course selector. This displays the current course that you've selected. As we work our way down, you see the bearing pointers. These will display needles on the HSI that point directly to whatever nav aid that you have selected to be active. Next is the CDI selector. This will select the nav source to be displayed on the HSI. And then finally, as we work our way around, we see the to from flag. This indicates that if you were to track the current course, whether you would be flying to or away from that nav aid. Now, let's take a zoom in view of our G1000. And you can see up at the top, the GPS information bars. These bars with magenta lettering indicate that GPS is currently programmed. As we come down to the bottom, you can see that by pressing the CDI soft key, it will cycle the HSI to display the, uh, the magenta GPS on the CDI. So if it's showing green, that means that you have a ground-based nav aid like a Vortec, and if it's showing magenta, that means that you've got a GPS-based nav aid. And then finally, we want to take a look at these GPS modes. Near the center of that heading indicator, you will see either en route, terminal, or approach. Now, en route will be displayed with three letters, E-N-R, and this will give me accuracy of two nautical miles either side of the CDI, over 30 nautical miles from the destination airport. Terminal will be displayed as T-E-R-M, and that will give me one 
nautical mile accuracy either side of the CDI within 30 nautical miles of the destination airport, and then approach. Now, approach will show these three dots and a maximum of 0.3 nautical miles either side of the CDI, but it depends on GPS approach that has been programmed into the system. This occurs at a minimum of two nautical miles from the final approach fix on an approach that has been activated. Well, folks, we want you to review all of that, of course, in detail with your flight instructor. And that just about wraps up our review of GPS for the instrument rating course. Join us next time.